Venice. So see Venice and die. Now I can go back to my country and tell my people, see Sydney and die. <laughs> no, no. We started with advertising the Quran in our local New Sunday newspapers, one called the Sunday Tribune. We advertise Quranic verses under the heading, The Quran Speaks, a message from the Quran, and giving our name and address that further inquiries can be made and for free literature they can write. And then the same thing we started doing for the African people in the Zulu language newspaper called Ilanga Lasi Natal, mean the son of Natal in which we had Ikuran Yakuluma, which means what the Quran says. And again, the same technique, verses from the Quran translated into Zulu and offering people free information and, and, and uh, literature. In buildings you'll find the sign saying, read Al-Quran, the last testament. Read Al-Quran, the last testament. During the day, the sign is there, and at night, it flashes, you know, the color, so in other words, attracting people's attention. We have so far handled this office of mine, some 85,000 Holy Quran translations, Arabic text, translation and commentary, which we have been selling, and what returns we get, gets plowed back into propagation. I want to help the people in Sri Lanka, and in India, Pakistan, in the UK, we want to do this, that the Quran is made available. We are reproducing videotapes of our lectures, mostly on comparative basis. Like this particular one, it says, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the Bible, in resp response to Swagat. Whole world is crying for these tapes, because it's something novel to them. It's, it's really a novel thing, because they have heard lectures about only addressing Muslims, how to make salat, we must give zakat, we must not drink, we must not gamble, you know, we must be attired Islamically and all that. They have been listening to that continuously for centuries now, for decades. But now comes along something novel in, in a, most especially people in a Western environment, like in the United States or in any other country where Muslims are, where the Christian missionaries are making onslaughts, like in India and in Pakistan and in Bangladesh and in Indonesia, wherever the Muslims are, we find that they are under attack and they don't know how to respond. They don't know how to respond to these Christian missionaries. So our tapes are doing the job. So there is a demand all over the world, so the department is expanding and increasing. So we have now exploited the machines, these electronic wizards, by creating what we call Islamic telecoms. We have two uh, in Durban at the present moment. One in our own building here, two of our shops. You know, we took them over, shops in the building, and we t changed them into Islamic telecoms. What happens there is that in the window, we have a monitor that at least 16 hours a day, our programs are being played, passers-by are being attracted. Then inside, we have seating accommodation that the people can, can sit inside, watch the monitor inside, in comfort. We have now started training Da'is, people who can go and propagate Islam. Because the Muslims all over the world, where I go and lecture, they seem to have taken a liking to my approach. Because something that was lacking in, that the Muslim didn't know how to approach the non-Muslim, the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, and I'm showing them how it can be done. To me, it's a, just a very natural thing to do, which Allah gives us the secret in the Holy Quran when He says, Qul, tell them, Ya Ahl al Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. Some understanding us about basics. And then Allah tells us what to talk about. But now we have not been doing that because we didn't know how. Allah is telling you on a common platform, talk about this. Allah na'abuda illa Allah, wa la nushrika bihi shay'an, wa la yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaba min dunillah. The most memorable visitors here was the head of a Catholic church body, Mr. Dawood Ngwane. I was looking for a particular book in my son's bedroom. There's a pile of 
old books in my son's bedroom. I was looking for a book that I wanted to use. And um, <clears throat> while looking for this little, this book, I found this little booklet. And the, 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 uh, the title attracted my attention, Crucifixion or Crucifixion. I thought, what, is, what does it mean? So that day, I read the booklet three times. I tell you that I couldn't put the book down during my supper time. That day, Mr. Nguani's world was turned upside down. At the age of 63, he began a new life as a Muslim. But he was never able to have another conversation with Ahmed Didat at the IPCI. The vibrant, dynamic orator was violently catapulted into a body which no longer worked. He suffered a stroke which left him completely paralyzed from the neck down. Unfortunately, most maps providence would have it. On the 3rd of May 1996, Sheikh Ahmad Didat was struck by stroke whilst on duty and became incapacitated, being unable to move any limbs, unable to speak, and unable to eat. However, providence in its mercy retained Sheikh Didat's hearing, eyesight, and ever sharp and alert mind. Sheikh Didat communicates with a unique combination of my eye movements, identifying the English alphabets. For the past six years or so, Sheikh Didat is now confined to his bed in Verlum, but still influencing and changing the hearts of people all over the world with the legacy of his books, videotapes, and infrastructure that he left behind at the IPCI. Despite his handicap, Sheikh Didat has dedicated and dictated many books from his bed via the eye communication method. However, it can be said with humility that no other South African or perhaps no other sick person has had so many visitors from all over the world, ranging from government ministers, TV crews, from major international networks, religious leaders of all religious groups, academics, scholars, and ordinary people. In this snippet, we see Minister Louis Farah Khan from America paying a visit to Sheikh Ahmad Didat at his home with his entourage on his recent visit to South Africa. Africa. And last time, I had the privilege of going to meet one of my heroes. Who is that? Ahmed Didat, one of the great champions of Islam. He's a hero of mine. We have shared many days together. He visited me in my home in Chicago, Illinois, and I visited him here and saw him in the days of his strength. And last night, I saw him even stronger. His brain is sharp. He can see, he can hear, he can think, he just can't speak. But his faith is so strong. I came from his bedside so inspired, so uplifted. And I said, Father, when I go back, I will carry on your great work. One of the core programs of the IPCI is what we call human resource development, training of individuals to meet the challenges and the new challenges facing us globally, nationally, and internationally. Here we see a, the last July group of students from all over the country who have come in for a one week intensive training program that was run at As Salam Institute. These are uh, the Duat from all over the country, some as far afield as Botswana, Lesotho, Zambia, and the nine provinces. One of his most memorable visits was when a familiar face showed up and greeted him, this time as a Muslim. When I decided that I'm going to become a Muslim, I woke up, up in the morning and I told my wife that I'm going to convert to, to, to become a Muslim. 
and I went to the IPCR to go and see you, to tell you. I thought I was going to break the good news to you. And on that day, when I came at the IPCR, they told me, you, you know, you, you were sick and you had been, uh, you were paralyzed. On that day. Today, they watched the video of that first day when Dawood walked into Ahmed's office demanding answers. It's strange for both of them to look back on that day now. Each man lived a completely different life back then. And six years ago, he suffered a stroke which was known as a lock-in syndrome. Lock-in syndrome is that my father can hear, understand, feel everything.